my side, a warm welcome to everyone here today. I'm so glad that you have joined us for the final part of our series, The Path. For the last, the previous three weeks, we, we started this series, and it's based on a book by Andy Stanley called The Principle of the Path that really changed my life path when I was a, a, a young man right after school. And we've already said three things, and I want to quickly recap so that you know exactly where we are today. The first week we said that every decision you make is connected. It is a step down a specific path which is a, has a specific destination. So we need to be careful in how we live life because it can lead to a good destination or a bad destination. The second week we said don't let your attention drift towards things because when your attention drifts, slowly you start to drift. So you might be thinking you're heading down the, the right path, but if your eye catches something wrong and you start looking towards that, you will drift in the wrong direction. And then last week, we said you cannot, even if you pick the right paths in life, you cannot always avoid danger, you cannot always avoid bad things, but you have a choice what you do when you encounter danger on your life path, and either you can be, as Solomon said, like the foolish and run straight into it and pay the price, or you can be wise and you can take refuge in God. And today we're going to continue this series, and I wanted to share a little story of when I learned to drive. Now, as I mentioned before, in South Africa it's mostly stick shift, right? So that's already <coughs> significantly different than learning to drive with the automatic vehicle. But when I learned to drive... We didn't have GPSs. Maybe if we did have, they just started. But we didn't have GPSs yet. So I learned to drive. And um, my first year after school, I was working in different cities all, all across South Africa. And the city that I later went to study in Pretoria, I one day had to go there. And I had a map, and I looked at this map in advance, but when you get into a city, there's all these one-ways, and suddenly you're driving up a one-way, and you realize that you have to like, just pull off to the side and pretend that you, know, you did it intentionally. But um, I ended up in these one-ways. I don't know where I am. And what I did is my dad is like a walking GPS. You can see he grew up in the time before, I think, maybe maps. Because I would call him. It was this little old cell phone with this tiny color screen was one of the first color screens I was saying, pressed like really pixelated, right? And I would call my dad, and my dad would be like, okay, Louis, what do you see? And I would be like, I see a really big tree with pink flowers on it and a, a shell garage across the road. And he's like, oh, this is where you are at. I'm like, how do you even know that? And he will go like, so just drive out, turn right, and then when you see a pink or a purple mailbox, you turn left there. I'm like, seriously, how does he know this stuff, right? He's like a walking encyclopedia for roads. But I often did that because even with a map, I would get lost. I one day got so lost that I ended up in a township in South Africa where, quite frankly, it's not really safe to be on your own. And a stop street there is not treated as a stop, okay? There's not even a thing like here where you kind of do like a rolling stop. You know, you stop, but your wheels doesn't completely stop. And they just go over in third gear, so like 40, 50 kilometers an hour. That's a stop there. And so many times I ended up in horrible places because... Although I could drive, I don't know how to navigate. And even today, I'm still pretty bad at navigation. Yolanda is my navigator on my GPS. I use my GPS to drive from my house to, to um, No Frills, which is basically down the street. So I really suck at it. And it just made me realize that the same is true for life, right? We all are trying to get somewhere. And just because you can drive does not mean you know how to navigate. But here is the problem in life. When we try to pick the right path, we have to make a decision to, today, but we'll only experience the outcome tomorrow. So the decisions you make in high school, whether you're going to study really hard and work, or whether you're going to have fun and play the whole time and just do nothing, that's going to have an effect on your life when you go to university or college. The decisions you make when you are in high school or in your 20s about dating and how you're going to approach those relationships are going to affect you when you are 30 years old, you're married, and you have children. The decisions you make when you get married about how you're going to live your financial life, whether you're going to live with a budget and save, will affect you one day when you want to retire. And in our spiritual lives, the decisions that we make today about how we want to live our spiritual lives will have an effect not just on your life down the road here, but also on your eternity. And just because I could drive doesn't mean 
I could navigate. And I learned back then that I needed a navigator to help me find the right, right path. And I believe in life it's the same thing. We need to find a guide, I, outside assistance that will help us from, to get from where we are to where we want to be in a safe and timely manner. Because when I get lost on a road, I lose 20 or 30 minutes. But when you get lost in life, you can lose a whole season. It's not worth it. We need a guide, someone that knows the path and someone that can guide us on the right path. So today, the final part of our series, The Path, um, our topic today is a better GPS, a global positioning system. Because what's amazing about a GPS, this is probably the best invention I think ever. Okay, if I, you know that question, like if you're ever stranded on an island, what's the one thing you would take with you? I think it would be a GPS, otherwise I would never find my way back to my own shelter, right? So we need to find a better GPS, and this is the difference between a GPS and a map. A map shows you the paths, it doesn't tell you which one to take. A GPS does not only show you the paths or know where they all lead, but it also tells you which road to take. And we'll be reading today um, another proverb, because we started it out reading some of the proverbs, um, all sayings written by the wisest king to have ever lived, King Solomon. And um, we're going to read one of the last Proverbs from him for this series. And that is Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6 from the New Living Translation. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding and seek His will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. Now Solomon is quite frank here. He just comes straight out. And he says, I want to encourage everyone that's reading this. I want to encourage my children, which by the way did not follow his advice. If you go and read the rest of the life story in Kings. But I want to encourage my children. I want to encourage the readers of this book to choose God as a navigator in life. So what I want to do today is I want to answer two main questions. And the first one is, okay, Solomon, if you say God is the God, my first question is, do I actually need a guide in life? Or can I get by on my own? And the second question, is God an, the best guide that I could possibly pick? Is, it, is he the, the one to go for, or could I find something better? Now, the first one, is it really necessary to have a guide? This I don't want to spend too much time on, because this is the truth about life. Each and every one of us base our decisions and make decisions in life, not just by, on our, by our own understanding, but we make it based on guidance that we got from somewhere else. Why do I say this? Think about this. You're not the first person on earth. You're not the first one to attempt anything in a certain way. You are probably, whether it's your parenting, your budgeting, you are probably influenced by your parents. Their guidance have probably put you on a certain path in life. You are probably influenced by teachers or by coaches that has had an impact on your life, negative or positive, and they have directed you to live your life in a certain way. Maybe you've been struggling and it's a counselor or a life coach that's been giving you advice on how to live your life. Maybe it is your friends. Maybe it's culture. Maybe it's TV. They say the biggest influencer on millennials ever was MTV. So I don't know what, what influenced your life, but the reality is you do not just randomly invent new paths every single day. We all follow some guide in life. You cannot get away from it. So I, wanted to, I want to encourage you, even before we continue, to stop for a moment and to reflect on your own life and say, like, where did I really get my life mapped from? Okay, did I consciously choose it? Did I inherit it from my parents? Did I pick it up as a response to how I was raised? Some of it might be, I'm going to do it the same way, or I'm going to do it the opposite way. Or maybe, did I get my my life map from just following the herd, following the crowd. I think one of the most crucial decisions you can make in this life and will make in life is not to choose whether you're going to follow a guide or not. We are all following guides every single day. That's not a choice to make. It naturally happens. The most crucial decision 
you can make in life is whose map you will follow. Not if I'm going to follow a map. And if we have no intentionality about this, if we're like, this is not a real priority for me, I'm just going to live my life and see where it comes out and follow whatever maps comes up. If you have no intentionality, it's going to lead to a bad place and you're at the end of the day going to pay the price. I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make today, especially in a world where social media and news and everything is right at our fingertips, is that we fall for this herd assumption, right? Where we look at the world and the direction the world is going, and whether we do it actively or passively, we follow the crowd. Like if everyone is in debt, this is a Western phenomenon. If everyone is highly indebted to pay houses and cars and cell phones and all kinds of stuff, like that must be the norm. So the herd assumption is then I must be in debt. If everyone, if all successful people work so hard that they only see their children over a weekend, then clearly in order to be successful, I must work the same way. I only see my children on weekends, right? And somehow we start to believe that if the whole crowd is following this, then it must be right, so somehow it will work out. We all do it un like unconsciously. We don't actively necessarily choose it. But here is the problem. It's not necessarily good. It doesn't necessarily work out. Because just as you and I can make bad decisions, and just as we get sidetracked by things, so it happens to society as well. Can you remember the things that sidetrack us? We spoke about it, emotions. The world does the same thing. Morality in the world is often based on that. Whatever makes us feel good, whatever feels appropriate at this time, we will just go with that. If it makes me feel good now, I'll do it. We spoke about a short view of life. Like, I don't care about what, what's coming in the next generation or the generation after that. If this works for me now, if it brings me pleasure now, let's just do it. And we sp spoke about cultural pressure and we've seen that happening between different countries as well, where one country will make a law about something and then they just follow like a string, right? Because there's pressure from my peers. So the same way that you can get sidetracked, society can get sidetracked. So just because everyone is doing something doesn't mean it's necessarily heading in the right direction. The problem is if we're all in this one stream and that stream goes south, we often realize it's too late. If you've ever played the game Lemmings, it's, it was a game years ago and it's back on, on cell phones and stuff. It's these little, I don't know what they are, worms people, it's lemmings. And, and they pop out and you have to create this little path for them through a maze. But they just follow each other. So if you make one mistake and the one falls off the cliff, they don't stop, everyone goes over. And that is the problem when we have this herd assumption that because everyone is doing it, we will be, be okay. If everyone starts falling off, you'll fall off with them. So be more intentional with who you're going to get guidance from. You need the right kind of guidance. Someone who knows all the paths and where they lead, and who can guide you along the right path to take. But the problem is in order to truly get guidance, here's the hard part. You have to ask, you have to ask for guidance. Now, if you're a woman, you might be like, oh, that's not too hard. If you're a man, you're like, what, seriously? Maybe you've forgotten this. Pre-GPS days, you're lost for two hours. Your wife keeps telling, just pull over and ask someone for direction. He's like, no, we're almost there. Like, I've got it. You know, just another right turn. Like, I don't know why it's so hard for me to ask for guidance, for direction. But it is hard. And Solomon actually talks about this. He says that we tend to naturally lean on our own understanding. We think we can figure things out. We think we have all the knowledge. And even if I get sidetracked, somehow I will find my way back. A different way to say that is we struggle with pride. I don't want to hear that I'm wrong. I don't want someone else to tell me what to do. But if you are, are you, think about this for a moment. If you're still at this point in your life, maybe today, and maybe I'm talking about Jesus, and you're like, I haven't decided to follow him yet. I'm still uncertain. I'm not sure if I want to ask for guidance. Let me ask you, are you so convinced that you cannot be proven wrong that you are willing to get lost 
for years and maybe for eternity. Just so you can believe that you're always right. Jesus also spoke about this. And Jesus used an analogy a little bit different than the path. But Jesus loved to preach using stories and analogies. And we often call them parables. A parable is a story that has a specific meaning that points us somewhere. And Jesus uses a different analogy, but it's, it's about pretty much the same thing. And if you've got your Bibles, would you please open to Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27. It's going to be on the screen as well. But it's cool if you have it open with you. Jesus <clears throat> preached one of the biggest sermons the world have ever known. He touched on almost every subject. And then when he has to summarize everything he said, this is his summary. And he uses an analogy in Matthew 7 from verse 24. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I want you to see something in this. Jesus himself says that we are more than capable of living life without him. We can build a house without Jesus. That man built a house on sand, and in the short term, it looked really well, right? He's right on the beach. He steps out his front door, and the sand on his toes. Like what could be better than that? But the problem was when the storms came, he built a house on his own without the guidance of Jesus that seemed really good in the short term. But when pressure came, the house crumbled. So Jesus is saying that the weak foundation led to a weak structure. And when pressure comes, that will happen in life. We spoke about it last week as well. Things crash. So it might be okay navigating life for a short while, building a house on your own and cutting God out of the equation, getting your input from wherever you feel it's working. That might work for a while. A while. It might even bring you some happiness for a while. You might feel good about it for a while. But at some point when your plans run out, it's going to come crashing down. At some point when storms start battering your house, it's going to come crashing down. At some point when you and I will close our eyes here on earth because death is something none of us can escape, that house will come crumbling down and there will be nothing for you after this. Jesus actually uses the words exactly the same way that the writer in Proverbs used it, the foolish and the wise. So there's a way to build that's foolish and a way to build that is wise. And Jesus encourages us through this to say, don't be the foolish person who builds a house just to see it crumble. Be the wise, and then he offers to be a guide, to help us to direct, to build our houses in such a way that it can withstand the challenges in life, so that that ha house can stand for eternity. And maybe you're here today, and you're like, okay, Louis, I understand I follow a guide. I understand I have to be intentional about picking him. Maybe this Jesus could be the right one. How do I make him the guide for my life? Solomon said it in one way and Jesus is in another way that's basically the same thing. Solomon said, trust in God with all your heart. Okay, Jesus says, we need to hear his words and put it into practice. Now that is different, but it's the same thing. It's, here, here's the principle. There is a big difference between knowing about God. Do you know who the first characters in the Bible are to acknowledge Jesus is the son of God? Not disciples or believers, demons. They knew about Jesus. They didn't believe in him. 
So there is a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Him. Knowing Him means, the Bible says, that I have hope, that I've got confidence, that I trust in Him. And the only way for you to actually trust someone is not to say, I trust them. The only way to have confidence is not to say, I have confidence, but to actually do it. And I want to do a quick illustration. I did it at um, two schools where I did the chapels this week. And as I was preparing, I'm like, whoa, this is such a great illustration. So I want someone to help me with the illustration. But here's the rule. Okay, for your own safety, you probably need to be under 35. Because if you fall, I don't want you to break a hip, okay? So you need to be under 35 years old, and you need to trust me doesn't have to be completely, but you need to trust me at a pretty decent level. Okay. Who's coming to help me? Come on. Okay. Uh, now, Josh, you've already been up here. Someone else? Someone else? Someone else? I can't believe Josh hasn't learned his lesson. Like, he drank some vinegar last time. Come on. Okay. I will up the age to 40. Okay. Sam, you're not 40. You could have raised your hand earlier. Come up. So this is the difference that I want to illustrate between saying, I trust Jesus, and actually trusting Jesus. By saying, I believe in Him, and actually believing in Him, as He said, by putting into practice what we hear. Now come up, Sam, come on. You're walking really slow. I wonder if you do not trust me completely. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to blindfold you. You need to make sure, and remember, this is church. If you lie, there's big problems. So (laughs) you need to make sure that you cannot see anything. Okay, can you breathe? Yeah, you can take it off over your mouth. Okay, can can you see? Okay, Sam, do you trust me? Yeah. So I'm going to give you commands, and I want you to follow them exactly as I say. Okay, but first I'm going to do this. Turn, turn, turn. Come on, Sam, turn. If I were you, I would take my hands out of my pockets because you might just need them. Okay. Take three steps forward, big steps. One, two, three. Turn to your right 90 degrees. A little bit more. Let's do another 15. That's it. Now, I want you to run full speed ahead until I tell you to stop. If I say stop, you better stop. You're on a stage. Go, 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 go. That's a full speed stop. Okay, now I want you to turn to the left 15 degrees and walk ahead, walk straight forward, walk straight forward, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, and I'm going to spin you a little bit. Okay, now Sam, do you trust me? Yes. So I want you, without putting your hands out, they need to stay in your pockets now. I need you to sit down. You cannot feel for a chair. If I count three, you have to sit. One, two, three. (laughs) Thanks for your help, Sam. Guys, um, this is the thing about faith. It is one thing to say, I trust God, but it is a different thing to actually follow what he says. Even though I cannot see or predict the future, even though I don't know exactly where his path is taking me. Just knowing about Jesus and the Bible is not enough. If knowing about Jesus and the Bible was enough, then everyone in the world who claims that they are Christian would have never made bad decisions. Would have never ended up in bad places, would they? But it's not enough. See, the problem is not simply information or access to it. We all have access to information. You can download the Bible on your phone. You can read it on the internet. You can Google almost every topic under the sun, including Christian topics. Even if you are not a Christian today, you can walk into any store and buy a Bible. You probably have a Bible somewhere in your house from a generation before. And if you still do not have one, I can be like, just come to us at the info desk and we'll give you a Bible right after the service. The problem is not information or access to information. Can I tell you what the big problem is that we face? 
submission. We're not willing to submit to Jesus. That is what it means to actually follow Him, to do, as He said, not just to hear my words, but to do my words. That is what it means to trust in Him with all of our heart. And I want you specifically, because when I started this, I'm like, okay, what if, what if I want to choose this Jesus? And that's maybe to, speaking to all of you who hasn't made a decision for Jesus yet. But I want to now speak to every, each and every Christian in this building, whether you've been following Jesus for a year, for 10 years, or 30 years. And I want you to hear this very, very clearly. Choosing the right path begins with submission, not information. Jesus said we can hear His words and do nothing with it. You can study theology. You can love dogma. You can read all kinds of commentaries. You can sit in church every Sunday and and puff your head up with knowledge. But that's not enough. You have to choose to put it into practice. Solomon said it in a different way. He said, trust God. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't just go with what you think is right. He says, rather trust His way. Rather trust God. And this is what it means. It means that if we want to do something and it conflicts with God's way, fully trusting God means that I'm going to choose His way even when I cannot see the outcome. means that I'm going to trust that He has my best, He has the best intention for me. He has the best plan for me. And this doesn't just go for your spiritual life. In verse 6, what does what Solomon write? Proverbs 3, 3 verse 6. After he said, trust him, he says, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. In all you do means in all of your ways, in your dating ways, in your marriage ways, in your entertainment ways, in your morality ways, in your education ways, in your professional ways, in your financial ways. Not simply your Sunday ways, your Bible study ways, your prayer ways, your Grace Church ways. In all of your ways mean in all of your, means in all of your ways. All means all. In every area of life, Jesus says, acknowledge me, put my words into practice, and then your house will stand. Then, or as Proverbs said it, he will show you which path to take. Some translation says, and he will make your path straight. And then we can get confused and think, okay, this means that as long as I acknowledge him, I can pick whatever path and he will make it straight. That's not really what, what what it means. The better translation is he will show you which way to take. God, when we acknowledge him, he will make the best path for us to take obvious to us. Just as my failure... To use that map got me lost in a place where I shouldn't have been, where my life could have been in danger. And just as your unwillingness to maybe submit to your GPS that keeps telling you make a U-turn can lead you to a bad place. So if we are unwilling to submit to Jesus, it can lead us to a bad place. You're going to follow someone's guidance in life. You're going to follow someone's map in life. There's no way around it. Make sure you follow the right one. Make sure you submit to the right navigator. And he says divine direction. So really direction that's not just coming from humans, but supernatural divine direction coming from God starts with submission. Submit to the one, to the God who knows where each path leads. Submit to the one who knows which path you should take. Do you know why he knows it? Because he's the one who created you. The Bible says for purpose. Submit to the one who knows what is best for you. And that best is better than what you think is the best for you. Submit to the one who can truly set you free can bring you forgiveness, you can bring you healing. Submit to the one who can reconcile you with your heavenly father that you thought was never possible. Knowing 
doesn't make the difference. Doing does. Submitting does. So what GPS are you going to use in life? What map are you going to follow? I believe there's no better map than Jesus. Not just for this life, but for eternity. I want to encourage you today to not be like what Jesus is, to be a foolish person building your house on sand that will crumble in your own with your own wisdom, but to be a wise person who says, I want to put my trust, I want to submit to someone else. I want to submit to Jesus because I truly believe that he has got something better in mind for me. And at the end of the series, even if you're sitting here today and you're still a little bit unsure, I want to encourage you and say, why don't you start living His way? Why don't you start learning it and see where He takes you? Worst case scenario, you're a better person, right? Best case scenario, your whole life is changed forever. Let's pray. Jesus, I truly believe what Your Word says is true. That there is no better way to build our life houses than on the foundation of Jesus. I truly believe that there is no better path in life to take than the path that you show us. I want to pray for every Christian person in this room, everyone watching online. I want to pray that we will move from information to submission. That we will stop just feeding ourselves and growing our heads. But that our hands would turn into the hands of Jesus. That our feet would walk where Jesus would want us to walk. That we would be doers of your word and not just hearers. I pray for every person who is still uncertain whether they should follow you. Oh Holy Spirit, I pray that, that you will that you will just work in their lives. Not for our sakes, but because I know that what you plan for each one of us is so much better than we can ever plan for ourselves. I know that there's healing and forgiveness and life change in Jesus that we can find nowhere else. Therefore, I pray for every person who feels lost, who feels broken, who's trying to rebuild, who's trying to pick a new path, I pray, Jesus, that they would submit to you and that in you, they would experience life here that they could never experience on their own and life in eternity with you that is impossible without you. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.